Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that it turns out that it's not just your mom who passes along mitochondrial DNA. If you read my book Headstrong about mitochondria and how to turn on your brain, you learned what we all commonly believe that mitochondria comes from mom. Well, in some cases, you might have your dad's mitochondria. They're just not that common. So leave it to dads to break the rules in textbooks. It turns out fathers in three unrelated families have been documented to pass their mitochondria, those tiny little things we like to call energy factories uh, found in cells uh, onto their children. And if, if you're familiar with lots of the stuff I talk about, mitochondria do a lot more than make energy. They're actually the frontline environmental sensors. And as you're going to hear about in today's interview, uh, they do more than that when it comes to interacting with your brain. Uh, but scientists have long thought that Kids just always got mitochondria exclusively from mothers because mitochondria and sperm get destroyed during the fertilization of the egg. And this happened because a mitochondrial disease researcher said, wait, how is this possible that we could have paternal DNA in a woman? And after they did a bunch of work on this stuff, they figured out that that woman's cells had some mitochondrial from mom and some from her dad. And they looked at the woman's brother who also had that thing. And they said, this can't be. So they asked a bunch of other researchers, and they found 17 people in the three families who had 24 to 76% of the mitochondria from their fathers. And the net net of all this for you is that if you wanted to blame everything on your mother, you can't anymore until you've done your mitochondrial DNA testing. All right. On that news, <laughs> speaking of blaming things on your mother, you should check out Game Changers, my new book, if you haven't already. It just passed 100 five-star reviews on Amazon, hit the USA Today bestseller list, and people on social media are really talking about those 46 laws for people who want to perform better, some of which are mitochondrial laws, but many of which have to do with how you think, your stress, and how you respond to the way you were raised. Basically, it's the rule book based on what hundreds of game changers have done, how they prioritize things so that you can prioritize what you work on first in the right way. And what you're going to learn in today's interview is awesome because you're going to find out that your mitochondria have a much heavier role to play in a lot of the things that you think are about the thoughts in your head, the voice in your head. My supposition has always been that the mitochondria are the evil little puppet masters behind your ego and I think we're getting a little bit closer to saying maybe that theory is true. We'll find out in today's interview, which is going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing because I'm a mitochondrial nerd. Uh, you might call me a mitochondriac. We had, uh, uh, we had t-shirts like that at the Bulletproof Conference a few years ago. And today's expert who's on the show is a guy I've actually wanted to interview for a long time because he's written some papers that I read on PubMed that got me really, really excited. And yeah, you don't hear that a lot uh, from, from people who aren't total nerds. But his name is Martin Picard. Uh, I already asked him. He's no relation to Jean-Luc. And he's an assistant professor of behavioral medicine in psychiatry and neurology at Columbia University. And for the last 10 years, he's been studying mitochondria and worked with leading experts. I mean, the godfathers of mitochondria. Godmothers, do you call them? Anyway of mitochondrial research. And in 2015, at Columbia, he established the Mitochondrial Signaling Laboratory, and they're figuring out how mind-body interactions work, including these unusual novel principles that underlie your mitochondrial response to stress, how you maintain your health, and how subtle mitochondrial defects can affect your cells and even your aging. So if you want to know exactly what's going on inside that biology of yours so that you can have better control of it. You better be paying attention to mitochondria. And here's a guy who's paid more attention to those little bastards than anyone else I know. Martin, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. It's really a pleasure to be here. All right. I got to ask you, has anyone ever called mitochondria little bastards in your experience before? No, I don't think so. I think that's the first time I hear that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to know, Martin... How the heck did you get so interested in mitochondria of all the things you, you could have done? Well, I was a, an undergrad student in physiology and at McGill University in Montreal. And I really was hoping to understand, you know, why is it that some people just 
stay healthy for a very long time and some other people just tend to get sick all the time and i do i guess maybe from personal experience and you know my mom is a nurse uh it seemed to matter you know how people felt and and you know that that would influence their health and and some physiological functions we all have experience about you know feeling not so good and then you know being more vulnerable to getting a cold and there's actually really good research on that so when you feel stressed or anxious you're more likely to get sick correct okay good deal yeah. and you wanted to figure out what the heck is going on there why yes so I, as i was a physiology student i thought you know surely i'm going to learn about these things you know psycho neuroendocrinology you know how the the psychological factors affect the hormones and affect the body and and <laughs> As I was a student, it would, the, the, the fashion at this time at that time was um, you know cellular physiology. So I learned all, all about the molecules and about different parts of the cells and, and genes. And there was nothing about the, the psycho part of it, you know, the psychology and psychology. Um, so I thought that was a little disappointing. And then towards the end of my degree, I, I was you know looking for uh, for ways to learn about these things. And then I studied integrative medicine, um, and then eventually you know, landed on this professor in graduate school who was a mitochondrial expert. She had just been recruited to uh, McGill University. Her name is Tanya Taivasello, and she studied mitochondrial disease. And then she said, oh, why don't you come, you know, work with me? And I was always attracted to mitochondria because, uh, you know, you heard about them as the powerhouse of the cell. And I kind of felt like there might be more to it and, and it'd be a, a useful track to follow. So I was... Um, you know, attracted to mitochondria initially, kind of with a, <laughs> kind of a visceral feeling, and and then uh, there was this opportunity to work with an expert. Wait, wait! Don't visceral feelings come from mitochondria? <laughs> they might. They might. <laughs> I, I don't think we know that for sure, but they, they might. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna argue that we do know that for sure, uh, yeah. just based on reductive logic, because, well, where do the electrons that drive the feelings come from? They're produced by mitochondria, right? Correct. So I mean, if, yes. if you go down to the electro, the electron itself, those visceral feelings had to come from a mitochondria. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's that's going deep very, very quickly. But uh, indeed, you know, you could argue the reason we are alive and the reason we breathe is because of energy flow in the body, right? Yes. If you, if you think about the fundamental difference between a living organism, a, a living, thinking, feeling, conscious person... And a cadaver, a dead body, is the main difference is the flow of information. Yeah. You know, the molecular components of the body are exactly the same, but in the living, thinking, feeling, conscious person, these are these molecules are animated by the the flow of energy. And a big part of that is you know going through mitochondria. And if if you want to convince yourself how important the flow of energy is to consciousness. <laughs> And you just, you know, block your, you know, the carotid arteries and, and your <laughs> neck that go to the brain. Then you, you, if you interrupt oxygen flow to mitochondria and the brain within, I don't know, 15 seconds, 10, 15 seconds, then you're, you're out. Consciousness is gone. So I think that tells us, it's kind of a loose argument, but it tells us something very profound. I think about the, the link between energy, consciousness, and our experiences and how we experience the world. What makes sense now is you mentioned that you'd studied integrative medicine or functional medicine uh, as a part of your your path. And a lot of times when people are doing more university focused research and they haven't studied some of the the holistic side of things, you're not going to have the the view that you do because you did a paper with uh, Dr. Eppel, uh, who's been on the show, uh, Alyssa Eppel. We talked about stress and telomere lengthening, one of the things that makes you old, and um, so you've done work on aging and you're doing work on, you know, these, these feelings and emotions and how they come together and looking at it from a, a single root cause, uh, which is unusual. Uh, in, in my experience with academia, you, you tend to focus on, you know, kind of one, um, one stack. And so to say, I'm looking at this, but you're looking at one cause that may be filtering out into many different things. Did you grow up with weird parents or something that made you multidisciplinary <laughs> like that? Um, I think my mom was definitely inclined to um, to think outside the biomedical box. Okay. Uh, having training as a nurse and having you know direct personal experience with um, with patients, and um, so maybe that was part of it. Uh, I tend to you know uh, credit my mom for for a lot of things, and maybe maybe that's one of it, um, In including your mitochondria. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, I, and just for, for people listening, I'm going to keep making mother mitochondrial jokes all episode long and you're just going to have to deal with it. All right. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> What was uh, so, your question again? You no, know, I was just wondering, like, like, why do you have this a, oh, a yes. lab? And you're looking at aging, you're looking at stress, you're looking at emotions, and you're looking at mitochondria. And and this is out of the norm for the last, well, I'm going to call it 200 years of academia until you go back to like the natural scientists, natural philosophers before that, where they had spiritual <laughs> and emotion and and a, a very very bad chemistry all mixed together. But it's been separated out for at least a hundred years, and here you are talking about emotions and you know subcellular components in the same sentence. You talk about aging, which hasn't been done before, and, and that's actually dare I say game changing. And I just, I don't know what made you the guy to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure I I have a good answer for that, but I think what we we've become really good at as you know a scientific community and maybe as as a population is reductionism Mm -hmm. Uh, and we've developed all sorts of you know disciplines and all sorts of you know scientific tools and you know machines in the lab um, which basically aim to break down very complex things into very small pieces that we can understand and grasp and you know make ourselves believe that we (laughs) that we understand how they work so that's you know the beauty of reductionism we 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 can take really complex things and then think, yes, this is how it works. This little piece A leads to piece B, and then that leads to C, and then that leads to D, and then, you know, somehow that's part of this bigger complex experience. Um, so I think we're really good at reductionism, and it's it has served us really well. If you look at, you know, the engineering feats that are happening now, and you know, we can go to space and we can, you know, make electric cars and. You know, we're maybe on the verge of becoming a lot more sustainable <laughs> as a society. Those are all, I think, products and all of the medical advances and, and the treatments that are available. They're products in large part of, you know, our reductionist approach to science. Yeah, no doubt that works. And anyone who says reductionism isn't useful is not paying attention. Correct. But it but it does take something out. That's what reduction is. Yes, <laughs> like exactly. The word itself, right? <laughs> so but, I, but you're I, adding something back in, which is yes. unusual. Yes, well, I think what my lab focuses on and what I what I see, you know, I think everyone in this world can make a contribution in some way. I, I hope that what maybe uh, our lab's contribution can be is to integrate things back together. <laughs> so we still use the tools of reductionism to understand different parts of the mitochondria and, you know, how they how they use the food that we eat, the oxygen we breathe in and, you know, transform that into energy and then generate specific signals. Uh, but we try to see this in the context of the whole person. So that's that's what we, we try to do. And uh, I think having trained in um, an integrative medicine, you know, might have helped. And I was, during my undergrad, I was also part of a systems biology training program. Oh, of course. <laughs> computational, you know, systems biology, integrative mathematical approaches. And then at the same time, I was part of a training program in psychosocial oncology to try to understand the psychological and the social aspects of, of cancer. Uh, so I guess all of these things together, it's like uh, when you're raised, you know, in, a, in sensitive periods of development, <laughs> things can have a big influence and maybe all of these things had an influence. And now, you know, have convinced me that the, really where, where things are at is in integration. So we try to integrate the subcellular uh, organelle, you know, the mitochondria being an organelle level uh, with s- cellular level and then, you know, the whole person and then the person within the environment and in its context. So the, I think it's really a movement towards integration. That's the driving force. You're one of the leading voices, uh, you and Alyssa and uh, Doug Wallace, another uh, major researcher who I, I think you, you studied with. Um, these are people, if you're listening to the show, you've probably never heard of any of these people unless I mean, we have a good number of, you know, of academic researchers and, and medical professionals who listen to the show who might have heard of them, but these are the people who are breaking beliefs left and right, where we just didn't understand how important this one part of the cell was. Uh, in my own life, having weighed 300 pounds, having had uh, what uh, we'll, we'll say, having had no ability to measure my mitochondrial function when I was 16, uh, when I had arthritis in my knees and and all this obesity and all, 
other than just to look and say, well, that guy's mitochondria seems to be making an awful lot of inflammation, which means they're not making an awful lot of energy. Um, that's called muffin top, in case you're wondering. Uh, but <laughs> you know, that, that whole thing, so I, I, I looked that way, right? And I could even draw causation from environmental toxins that lower mitochondrial function and things like that. Uh, but I don't have data because no one had data back then. However, everything that I've ever done that made me kick more ass at everything I do it basically makes my mitochondria either stronger or more efficient. And, and that's the body of work. Most of biohacking is around making those little bastards happier and faster, which makes you happier and faster. And that's why in my model of the world, there's a very clear line between mitochondria and the way you show up for your kids or your next meeting. And that's why I'm so excited both of this interview and just to share what on Bulletproof Radio. This is the stuff that changes your life fastest. All right, I'll get off my, my soapbox and ask <laughs> an actual question. Yes, Dave, you actually, you mentioned Doug Wallace. Yeah. And I'd like to take a moment to um, just say how important, you know, Doug was in, in yeah. for, for the field, you know, in my development, but, uh, you know, mainly for, for the field. Um, I remember when I was a grad student and I was starting to learn about mitochondria and mitochondrial DNA, right? Because it's the only other part of the cell other than the nucleus to have its own DNA. Yeah. Uh, and we can talk about evolution and, you know, where mitochondria come from and how they made us, you know, complex multicellular life possible, you know, for a long time. Um, but Doug was really a pioneer uh, in first identifying the maternal inheritance of mitochondrial DNA. And you kind of <laughs> address something, uh, you know, at the onset that uh, contradicts this. Uh, but uh, for the most part... He's, he's still right. The fact that there's a few corner cases. No, they come from your mom. Let's just be really clear. And Doug figured that out. <laughs> yes, yes. And he did so many, so much for the, for the field. And uh, I remember as a grad student, I was reading this, you know, I was on PubMed looking for articles that were relevant to what I was doing. And then I see this paper from Doug Wallace. It was mitochondria as chi. Mm -hmm. Chi, chi, this, you know, Eastern. Uh, <laughs> He's <tradition>. right. <laughs> <laughs> Traditional Chinese medicine concept. And I was like, wow, yes, you know, the, this is this is it. I need to I need to do my postdoctoral training with this person. Um, so that's that actually what made me write an email to Doug Wallace and, and say, can I, can I train with you? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's, it was, he's a visionary. How have you changed your life in the last 10 years? Because you know more than the average human by orders of magnitude about mitochondria. So given that, that you know more than I do, do you wake up every morning and like do a mitochondrial meditation? Do you drink a mitochondrial soup? I, I mean, like, like what has changed for you given what you know? Because I know for you, you have what you can publish in academia because you know, but I want to know you're going to lay the odds for yourself. I don't know what you're doing that you haven't published. <laughs> That's for you. <laughs> um, I definitely, you know, from the stuff we've uh, discovered in the lab and, um, you know, it makes a really big impression to me to see mitochondria because yeah. they're so beautiful. And uh, we do a lot of microscopy work, so you actually see them move about in the cell. You know, they if you ask Google, what do mitochondria look like? You you know, Google images, you get these pictures of bean-shaped little things or peanut-shaped or, you know, whatever you, 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 your favorite shape is. Uh, but if you actually look in a living cell, they're so beautiful and they move around and they can actually fuse with one another. It's called mitochondrial fusion. Mm -hmm. And the uh, long ones can actually fragment into small pieces. That's called mitochondrial fission. Uh, and seeing this and also, you know, just the inside of mitochondria on the electron microscope, this, you know, it's just something I love. And, and it makes an impression on me and reminds me how uh, how beautiful biology is. But that, uh, you know, these are important little creatures to nourish and we're finding out, how, you know, how do we nourish them? And I think you, you know quite a bit about that. We know moving, being physically active is probably the best thing you can do for your mitochondria. Um, and being inactive for a very long time is, is not so good. So I try to, I try to live by that and, and be active. Uh, eating too much is probably the second worst thing you can do for your mitochondria. And uh, if you have the choice to be hungry or to be overfed, you should aim on the hungrier side. <laughs> yep. A lot of studies have, have shown this. So do you do intermittent fasting? I have tried it, yes. And okay. um, I, I don't do it as a as a regular thing, but I'm very mindful of, of not overeating because it, it saturates the mitochondria. And for some reason, it, it makes them fragment and... Uh, 
probably not talk to each other so much. Um, so it probably also matters what you're overeating. Like a bowl of French fries versus a bowl of salad is probably going to have a different uh, a different effect on fragmentation. But no yes. one knows yet. <laughs> <laughs> we know a lot of sugar is probably the worst thing. Yeah. You know that affects the mitochondria. So that. How about alcohol? What does that do to mitochondria? That's a great question. I I don't know. Um, actually, there's some work being done by uh, Yuri Hanyaski at uh, Thomas Jefferson on this topic. It, it definitely affects them, but I, I don't know in what way. Because we know they can burn alcohol. In fact, they'll preferentially burn it to help get it out of the system as a fuel source, right? Before they'll even burn sugar. Uh, but it doesn't mean it does good things to them when they burn it. And we know the aldehyde spike and the rest of the body and the liver and in the gut is pretty bad for you. But I've never, I don't know the research either, so I'll have to follow up on that. Maybe that's another interview I could do. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, so sugar's bad. Uh, yeah. Okay, so for you, you don't overeat. You make sure you move. Oh, but uh, by the way, um, I also agree with you on the movement, uh, and I've got the couple of papers. Twenty minutes a day of walking is kind of the minimum necessary. But I'm lazy, so I stand on a, a whole body vibration platform called the Bulletproof Vibe. It vibrates thirty times a second, which is a frequency that they know causes regeneration. These these are for astronauts to recover. So if I stand on that for five minutes, uh, maybe ten, uh, sometimes while I'm on the phone or something. I kind of like to look at when you're culturing cells and you have those little those little things that are uh, you know keeping the cells moving. I'm like I'm just going to shake all my mitochondria a lot really fast <laughs> and kind of get it done for the day. I have no idea if that actually works for mitochondria, but I feel better, I look better, and I have less muffin top when I'm done. So, in <laughs> all right. So, so movement, food. Okay, those two are obvious. What else are you doing? Well, something we're beginning to to find is that how you feel might influence your mitochondria, uh, and um, and you know, that taps into this area that's developing called mitochondrial psychobiology. That's connecting the, the psychological part of who we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we do feel things, we do think about things, you know, that affects us. Um, and then the biology, those biological, molecular, cellular processes that are happening at the cellular level. So what we don't know a lot about is how those two things are connected. Uh, and the, the hypothesis that we're exploring with some of our colleagues uh, is that you know, mitochondria is that interface between the, the psyche and the soma, <laughs> mm -hmm. the, mind, the mind and the body. Uh, so and we've had some some results, a, a paper that was published earlier uh, in 2018, uh, showing that how people feel uh, a few days before you take blood to measure mitochondrial uh, functional capacity or mitochondrial health uh, is actually correlated. So uh, people, if people feel better, uh, it looks like their mitochondria have a greater ability to make energy uh, the day after. Uh, but if mitochondria, uh, better mitochondrial function doesn't predict how people feel, you know, in that study. So it actually is the first evidence that mood and psychological states might influence the mitochondria uh, and, and, you know, in that direction. Not that the other direction uh, isn't happening, but that study uh, showed quite convincingly that there might be a link from from the mind to the mitochondria. So I try to do things that you know that make me feel good. I try to you know this uh, focus on uh, on on projects and you know hang out with people who <laughs> who stimulate uh, who who are you know whole who are stimulating. And, and mm -hmm. I don't know if that really does something to my mitochondria, but uh, probably it, it keeps me motivated and inspired. And I think that's important. It's funny in uh, Game Changers. Uh, my last book, and yes, I'm plugging the book. If you haven't bought the book and you're listening to the show, come on, it's going to save you a lot of time to read the book. But the, one of the big three things that hundreds of people like you who've done really big work in their field, that they do is what you just said. They find a way to be happy, which causes their performance to improve. And, and rather than the other way around, it's, oh, I achieved, therefore I'm happy. I was happy, therefore I achieved. And achievement, as we've already established, well, it's driven by energy that has to come from somewhere. It, eventually, it comes from your mitochondria or maybe from sunlight if you're a plant. <laughs> now, yeah, um, you know, it's funny you mentioned the plant. You know, mitochondria do chemically, they do exactly the opposite as what, as what plants do. So, you know, plants take uh, water and uh, they, they take the, uh, the CO2, the carbon dioxide yeah. in the, the atmosphere. And then they basically fixate the carbon and the hydrogen, and then they make sugar, they make starch. Right. And in that process, release oxygen. And what do mitochondria consume? You know, oxygen. 
oxygen and starch. And then what do they release as part of the Krebs cycle? This is like the, the series of biochemical reactions and inside the mitochondria, they generate CO2 and they generate water. So now I'm gonna hopefully blow your mind, which might be hard to do. I referenced either one or two papers from some researchers in Mexico who proved pretty convincingly that if you eat enough uh, chlorophyll, in other words, you're eating lots of green vegetables, uh, that up to 5% of your energy requirements can be met by your mitochondria using sunshine, not food. And they actually have some lab measurements on this. And that, wow. that's referenced in Headstrong. So I'm wondering if you know that, that old movie called Swamp Thing, uh, maybe it was based on that, that, that corner case where, yes, a little bit's possible, kind of like having some of your father's mitochondrial DNA. It doesn't really happen very often, but it's possible. I, I think there's another little corner case for mitochondria <laughs> like that. So I like the idea of uh, being a breatharian and living off sunshine. <laughs> I'm just not going to do that because I got other stuff to do. <laughs> By the way, if you're listening and it works for you and you actually have done it with you know cameras and observation and you could show that it works, uh, I would love to see your evidence because it'd be kind of cool to find a human who could do that. Uh, maybe there's one in India somewhere who has some good evidence. But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, getting off track here. So you've, you've talked about how you feel. There's a, a supplement that I, I manufacture. It's called uh, Keto Prime, and it's uh, keto succinic acid. So it's the last step of the Krebs cycle before you reinitiate with coenzyme A, which is basically coming from carbs that you eat or from ketones. And when people take that, in two clinical studies, they showed that the compound in Keto Prime, the active ingredient called uh, that keto succinic acid, that it treats these symptoms or treats the emotional symptoms of PMS. Now, this is an interesting thing where you're feeling crappy and angry. You take something that increases your mitochondria's ability to make energy from food by priming the pump of the Krebs cycle, and magically, your emotional symptoms subside. So that would support your point that, well, maybe mitochondria are driving this happiness and maybe happiness is driving the mitochondria. I think there's something to that because I'm the same way. I'm like, I know if there's a stack of mitochondrial enhancers that I take, when I take them, I'm happier. And if I take them when I'm cranky, I get less cranky. Uh, what mitochondrial enhancers do you use? Uh, I don't use any mito enhancers. Other you don't drink than... coffee? Come on. <laughs> no, I actually love the smell of coffee, but I, I can't do the taste. So I, I don't. <laughs> oh, man. Well, if you put enough sugar in there, oh, wait, that would kind of defeat the purpose, wouldn't yes, it? Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so tea? I mean, you, you must use green tea or something. Yeah, I, I drink tea. Um, I drink there's, tea. There's your mitochondria enhancer. You got your polyphenols in there. Yeah, that might that might very well. <laughs> All right, if I send you a stack of the mitochondrial enhancers that I use just to try them, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not asking you to endorse or, or ever tell the world you did it, but just if you would try them, I'll send them to you because they might even fuel your research a little bit. Wow. You want me to send them your way? I will. No, I, I, you know. I don't, I don't think I would. <laughs> <laughs> I, I trust in the balance of the organism and, you know, its ability uh, to, to do things. So I, I try not to put other, you know, f foreign things in, in my body. That's maybe that's my philosophy. Got um, it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are, I think, situations where uh, these things can be useful. And, uh, you know, you're talking about the link between mitochondria and, and how you feel uh, right. and mood. Um, and there's good research that's coming out uh, linking uh, metabolism and mitochondrial metabolism and depression. Interesting. So they're finding depressed people have lower mitochondrial function? Yes. And the, there's a, a marker of, of mitochondrial function and specifically the ability of mitochondria to use lipids. Uh, so there, as we eat, you know, we're not talking about the, the trans fats that are in fries, but you right. know, the lipids are in pretty much everything that we eat. These are very healthy, you know, the, the perhaps the healthiest kind of lipids are like the avocado or like the olive oil and these mm -hmm. kind of things. Mitochondria love these. And, you know, they're so good at, at eating lipids and, you know, burning lipids. There's probably the cleanest thing that the organism, that the mitochondria everywhere in the body can, uh, can burn. Um, so what, people have found and then and a lot of that research is coming out of Bruce McEwen's lab at the Rockefeller University in New York City. Uh, they're finding that a specific marker, uh, it's called L-acetyl carnitine uh, uh -huh. and or L-car, uh, is actually low in people with depression. And if you, you can 
study these kind of processes and animal models. And if you take, you know, animals, rats or mice that are depressed, they tend to have lower levels of this. And if you, you know, supplement them uh, with L-acetylcarnitine, then you, it actually relieves the depression and the depressive symptoms. And there are actually quite a few clinical trials now underway to uh, look at this, which is kind of, you know, supplementing something that is naturally in the body and um, that is deficient in states of depression. And maybe that reflects uh, something at the level of mitochondria, mitochondrial dysfunction and their inability to to efficiently use lipids. And if you can restore this, maybe you can restore, you know, the ability of people to perceive the world in a, in a positive way. So that, that connects mitochondria to how we see the world. It, it's funny, acetylcarnitine uh, or L-acetylcarnitine, uh, either way, uh, different ways of saying the same thing, is... Uh, is a very common and well-known anti-aging compound going back at least 30 years. So we started supplementing that. People were looking to live longer. Before we knew what it was doing for mitochondria, because <laughs> you could see it was doing something good, but we didn't understand all the pathways we know now. And now we're understanding, oh, it increases a cell's ability to burn fat, mm-hmm. which is why maybe people who are going to be in ketosis uh, uh, intentionally, nutritionally, the way I talk about in the Bulletproof Diet, maybe going in and going out, you might want to make sure you have enough L-carnitine, which comes from eating red meat or from supplementing. So having that steak might not be such a bad idea, at least if it's grass-fed and doesn't contain antibiotics that also inhibit mitochondrial function. Let's go there for a minute. Mitochondria, ancient bacteria. Antibiotics kill bacteria. What's your take on mitochondria and antibiotics? There's a lot of good data that antibiotics can damage mitochondria. Yeah. Um, so I think we've overused antibiotics in, in different ways, uh, you know, in, in, in medical practice. Um, you know, we're really good at, at, at drugging <laughs> a lot of things, and sometimes maybe it's not necessary. Uh, so definitely mitochondria are sensitive, you know, nimbly little organelles. Uh, and they, they're clearly sensitive to antibiotics. Uh, so there's clearly a connection there. One of the things that uh, I went through as I was writing uh, my book, Headstrong, about mitochondria in the brain was let's find a list of the things that are documented in medical or, or biological studies to inhibit mitochondrial function. And what would happen if we just did those less? <laughs> right? <laughs> and not, not in a you know, avoid them with perfection and be afraid of them. But just if you have a choice, you know, don't eat the trans fats that screw up your mitochondria. You know, don't eat tons of sugar, but also things like antidepressants. A lot of antidepressants really wreck mitochondrial function. Mm. Um, and so I'm saying if you were to build a lifestyle around supporting the mitochondria on the supposition that, well, they'll support you back, you should do that. Have you looked at antidepressants or any other pharmaceuticals that might have negative effects on mitochondria and thus un? unforeseen but predictable effects on moods or energy levels? Mm-hmm. We haven't, you know, directly in, in our research, but other people have. Uh, and there's some people who believe that a lot of the side effects that uh, antidepressants and other medication have could be because they're altering mitochondria in some way. Uh, and people have discovered that there are different receptors on the mitochondria, receptors for uh, neurotransmitters like serotonin and uh, receptors for uh, all sorts of different hormones uh, on the mitochondria, including uh, the cannabinoid receptor. That's a receptor for um, cannabinoids and you know THC. Uh, so we know they're sensitive to a lot of things, and there's very little known, relatively speaking, about the effects of drugs and medication on on the mitochondria. Uh, yeah. So there's definitely a, a need to know more about that. You talked about mitochondrial signaling, and as I was digging through the research in a in a way different and nowhere near as in depth as you do, it looks like there's certainly chemical signaling between mitochondria. There's actual fusion where they stick together and swap some stuff, uh, and then fission that you talked about before. Uh, there's also potentially some uh, that they're responsive to electromagnetic fields. Uh, and they're also responsive to light, and they generate light. Do you believe <laughs> that mitochondria are using anything besides chemical signaling and fusion and fission to do uh, like quorum sensing or any of the other things that mitochondria do to work as a this distributed network of a quadrillion nodes? Uh, that's likely. Uh, I'm I'm not aware of um, 
of any <laughs> good data. You know, the, the biochemical community as a, in general tends to focus on the, the chemical yeah. stuff, you know, the stuff we can see or measure directly. Um, you know, the bio photons are, you know, photons emitted from living things, right. living organisms. Those are real, though, in that bio photons do exist. I, I do believe they exist, yes. Okay. They're, yeah. they're really hard like, to see. Yeah, but I've seen <laughs> hardcore physicists detecting them, like like with real equipment in real labs that aren't run by people wearing tinfoil hats. So I, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're real. But if, if you said, Dave, there's absolutely no evidence those people are crack smokers, I would reconsider. So you, you, you think it's likely. All right. Yes, I, I think biophotons are definitely real. Uh, the research on it has been a little, you know, put to the side because people have a hard time, uh, one, me measuring them, and two, fitting that into the traditional concept, you know, whatever, whatever paradigm a scientist is raised in, you know, is a really powerful thing, just like the environment we're raised in as a child. And how and why mitochondria would generate light signals is, is a little hard to fit into the traditional paradigm. Uh, so that makes, it makes these kind of things hard to to study and, and, you know, and push forward. So there's not a lot of research about this compared to chemical signals that mitochondria generate. Same thing for electromagnetic fields. And there's pretty good data that electromagnetic fields generated from different sources, biological or non-biological, can affect cells and, and probably mitochondria. Uh, but again, there's very little known about this, uh, which, which means probably we should study this more because that would be transformational. Yeah, I, I've seen enough data in each of those that I, I know something's going on there, but I would be the first to say, I don't know what. And my background is uh, computer science, and I uh, I did a lot of a lot of work on cloud computing, like the very first cloud computing and early internet stuff. I taught at the University of California, so I, I would consider myself well grounded in in that uh, you know, network effects and network behavior. And I look at mitochondria as a giant network in the body, and that they all have to communicate. Uh, there's algorithms we're using in crypto. Uh, that are very similar to what I believe our mitochondria are using for quorum sensing. Quorum mm -hmm. sensing is the idea, how do we know what we're going to do as a group here? It's yes. like voting, right? Um, so if you look at, say, aliens who'd be studying uh, the U.S. You know, in the, the late 1800s, saying, look, they send signals via the Pony Express. So all you have to do is just intercept the stagecoach, you know, use your x-ray to read all the letters and you know everything about these weird creatures on the planet. So they get obsessed with snail mail, okay? And then the telegraph comes out and then there's this one weird pointy eared alien. It's like, but there's gotta be something else here. I th see these little electrical bursts and they're like, shut up, have you read the letters? Like, like seriously, the letters are where it's at. And so they keep studying letters and to this day, they're probably looking at all this junk mail going, how do they get anything done with all this junk mail? but they haven't figured out that there's also another signaling network. And, and when we build the internet, we have the data flows here and there's a separate signaling network that controls the controllers for the data. And there's actually three or four of them depending on what topology you're going through and how urgent it is and whether everything's you know, about to break. So the body has to work the same way because that's how large scale systems always work. So <laughs> it's those other things that matter the most that I think we're missing. Now, here's a question for you. Given that that crazy alien world I just painted there, if you, as someone who's well grounded in what you've looked at, if you had to bet on one of those things we talked about outside of chemistry as being the most important one, where would you place your bet? <laughs> there has to be some form of non-molecular signaling. Uh, I don't know how far we are into kind of deciphering the whole, you know, alphabet or the whole system, the way we've decoded the, the genome, uh, the ACTG, the letters, and how that codes for proteins and so on. Um, so I, I'd say electromagnetic field and, you know, light, a lot of things, you know, there's a lot of good physical reasons why you would want to communicate with photons and with electromagnetic fields. It's faster. You look at light and EMF together. Yeah, in a way, you know, isn't I, light... I agree, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> light is a form of electromagnetic field and the same way that, you know, physical stuff is also, uh, to some extent, you know, the material materialization of some electromagnetic field, just, you know, denser than, than the usual stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's that's hard to say. The, the data is a little skim, 
to it is. to make a good prediction, but I think we can confidently predict that there's more than what we know. <laughs> uh, that's that's a very safe and very truthful way of putting it. The the light one is, is very interesting. Um, whether the lights that mito the biophotons that that mitochondria generate are sending a signal that's received by other ones. I would argue that Mother Nature wouldn't waste energy creating biophotons if they weren't of use, right? So they're either of use in in the body or outside the body. So maybe there's you know some kind of insect like a mosquito or something that reads your biophotons and says you're going to be delicious. I have no idea, right? <laughs> but I do know that I've I've looked at all of the all of the research on what different wavelengths of light do to the mitochondria and the melanopsin sensors in your eyes, and I've looked at melanopsin mitochondria. Uh, with Dr. Sachin Panda at the Salk Institute, and you know, on on a microscope, and one of my companies, True Dark, makes glasses that filter out all of the types of light that we know affect the melanopsin sensors, which are studied with extra mitochondria that control the timing system in the body, which also controls mitochondrial energy throughout the body. So you put these glasses on, and it's like noise canceling headphones for your eyes, and you really, really want to go to sleep. They they solve mm. jet lag for me. Right, and it's all based on mitochondrial light biology with the skimp <laughs> data we have to the point that it's a patentable thing. But I know there's so much more, and no one's been able to insert a little light sensor between two mitochondria and just listen for a photon that might come every five seconds. And I don't know if we'll ever be able to do that, but there, there has to be something going on there because mm -hmm. how else are they doing what they do? Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, following up on that, and I think you made a really good point about the network behavior of of uh, different elements of a system. You know, if you start really high up, you have humans that organize, you know, themselves into communities and, you know, people specialize, they do different things. And then through communication with each other, we can do amazing things. You know, we can build buildings, we can build yeah. you companies, you know, universities and so on. And then we just get better, but through the interactions of the units, right, of the people. And the same thing is true if you look inside a, a human body. You have different parts. Like, you know, there's a brain, there's a heart, there are lungs, you know, by themselves, you know, the brain doesn't do anything. The heart doesn't do anything. The liver doesn't do anything, but put them together, connect them through with a circulatory system, you know, of blood vessels and of nerves and, you know, everything. And then all of a the sudden, you know, there's beautiful, you know, life that emerges from this. And uh, this is all thanks to the network connectivity between these different parts. And we think the same thing is happening at the level of mitochondria. And uh, a cool example of that might be uh, some very important hormones in the body that I think everyone has heard about. These are the sex hormones, testosterone, mm -hmm. estrogen, and then the, the stress hormones like uh, cortisol. These hormones, all of them, are made inside the mitochondria. That, that is something that, that I wrote about in, in Headstrong and no one knows. I, you're listening to this. Okay, it's not just your balls and, and other various sex organs making your testosterone. <laughs> it is subcellular components distributed throughout your body, and you have more of those in your brain and your heart than anywhere else. So, okay, so now we know mitochondria are making sex hormones and energy hormones. Um, I don't remember, do they make thyroid hormone too, or they just respond to it? They respond to it. I don't know that uh, thyroid is made in the mitochondria. I don't believe it is, but I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, so, and the thyroid controls general energy levels in the body, but what tells a mitochondria make more testosterone versus less? That's a, that's a good question. Nobody yeah. knows that I'm aware of, but if you can solve that problem, you're going to put a lot of uh, drug companies out of business. <laughs> uh, but this is unlocking one of the basic keys to being human is why do your subcellular components not do what you want them to do, not do what's in your best interest. They're doing it for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And thinking about it from an evolutionary perspective, why would you put such an important process, you know, that regulates, uh, you know, sex and, you know, uh, gender, uh, you know, the sex hormones and then the stress hormones that basically can wake you up in the morning right that's what in part mm -hmm. what cortisol does to place these you know through evolution <laughs> why would you place these in the mitochondria and so you know there has there's a really deep connection there um between those you know large scale whole body regulation of energy and and physiological functions in the mitochondria so if the mitochondria can sustain that energy demand that would arise from you know developing and being masculine or feminine or um, you know responding to stress you better not secrete those hormones and 
So there, there, there's got to be a link there. And the interesting is that mitochondria in the adrenal gland, for example, which are little mm-hmm. glands on top of the kidneys, or mitochondria in the testes that would make the, the testosterone, or mitochondria in the ovaries that would make the estrogens. So these mitochondria produce the hormones, and then you have mitochondria in the brain that have receptors for these hormones. So it's you can see the whole organism as a network of mitochondria communicating with some mitochondria generating a signal, other mitochondria being the receiver of, of those signals. So that's a bit of a mitocentric you know, worldview, <laughs> but I, I, to some extent, I think that makes a lot of sense uh, biologically and, and conceptually. It, it's the only thing I can find uh, that matches everything I know about both Eastern and Western uh, practices. Uh, and also just if, as a design engineer, the reason the internet's built the way it is is so no one can break it. It's a highly distributed system that has emergent behaviors. Right? So if you cut off part of the internet, the rest of it can live. But if the internet lived in one big computer you know, underneath the NSA or the Pentagon or somewhere, um, you could blow up that computer conceivably and then take out all the internet across the world. So DARPA, <laughs> who created the internet, created it to be a fault-tolerant distributed system. And I think Mother Nature would follow the similar design algorithms and say, hey, what if your body was a fault-tolerant system? And not only that, if you believe, as I do, that the mitochondria are the puppet masters. They're the ones who are telling your body what to do. They're the ones reading the environment on a second-by-second basis. They're the ones who are the gateways to epigenetics. Well, if you're in charge, you wouldn't want to centralize control outside of something you control. So I think that they're doing that (laughs) because those little bastards don't want to let go. (laughs) Make sense? The, yep, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I could also just be crazy, but I don't think so. <laughs> when you put on your, your futurist hat, uh, you know, you've had 10 years of really digging on these. You work with some of the, the, the best and brightest in the field um, of mitochondria. What do you think we're going to discover over the next 10 years? Like, like where's the field going? I think our understanding of biology and the role of you know energetics bioenergetics um, is going to expand uh, such that you know we're forced to develop new approaches to study these processes and maybe through integration and you know, we talked about reductionism and reduction versus you know integration putting the pieces back together i think that's going to become more common a more common thing to do in the sciences and then uh, eventually, once we integrate things enough and we have a perspective that's inspired by bioenergetic principles, uh, we'll ha- start to have therapies uh, and you know approaches that we can use to uh, sustain health. I think there's not a lot, not enough thinking and research about that. You know what makes a person healthy and what sustains that. I know you've written a lot about that. Uh, and so not only to treat disease when the system has failed, you know, after years of dysregulation, but really understand those mechanisms of regulation of of health and, you know, ways to promote that in a non-destructive and non-inhibitory way. I think in, in the biological sciences will move more towards integration and that will lead to uh, new and better approaches to, yeah, to sustain people's health and to make people age better and Maybe also to uh, you know promote human development because uh, <laughs> if people are are healthier and happier, good things tend to happen. You have more energy to devote to uh, to creativity and, and and developing greater things. Can I test out one of my my core behavioral theories on you? I want you to poke holes in it if it's wrong because you know <laughs> a lot more about this stuff than I do. So I, I like to pretend I'm I'm just a bacteria floating on the ocean. I do this a lot at night. Okay, I don't really. But but if <laughs> if you pretend that that's it, you don't have a lot of processing power. You don't have a lot of memory. So you must repeat basic algorithms that are going to keep you alive, right? And the number one most important algorithm is run away from, kill or hide from scary things because they're going to eat you right now and game over you lost, right? So that, that would have to be weighted most heavily. The second thing you'd have to do is eat everything. Because if you don't eat everything, starvation will take you out within a day or a month or however long it takes your species to to starve, right? The third thing you'd have to do would be have sex with everything else. 
because if you don't reproduce the species, <laughs> then it's game over in one generation, right? Mm-hmm. And this is the algorithm of life, whether you're a tree, whether you're a slug, or whether you're a human. Like, like, and if you think about it, everything you've ever done that you're ashamed of is one of those three behaviors, right? <laughs> and they're all mitochondrial behaviors. Like, like it's, that, it's that ingrained into us. There's, there's a quadrillion plus of these little bastards telling us to run that program over and over. And, and you, when you repeat this a, a quadrillion times. So I, I think this is where all the bad stuff we do comes from. But the saving grace, which you reminded me of with your comment, is that there's a fourth F word. If we have fight, uh, feed, and the other F word. Um, the fourth one is friend. So what do bacteria do? They form biofilms. They specialize. They create a community. They support each other, and they they therefore grow better as a species. And that's the other thing that humans do, right? We also form communities and friends, and we support other people. But if you're constantly reacting to stress, you're starving, and you never get any, you're probably not going to be that friendly to the people around you. You're not going to to make everything nice. So what this means though, is that we are wired to be nice to other people when our basic needs are met. Like it's, it's as built in as our desire to protect ourselves. Mm. Um, so a lot of my work, a lot of the reasons I do everything I'm doing in the world are because of that fourth F where right? I think that's actually our core nature. Do you buy that? I don't know. I, <laughs> you know, there's this, I'm not sure if it's a debate, but you know whether we're the most evolved creature on the planet or not. <laughs> in some ways, you know we're very destructive, and you could say not so evolved. Yeah. Uh, but in another, I think, you know, I think there is something in us that is more developed than in others, and I really think this could not have happened without mitochondria yeah. and without the symbiosis. And what makes us truly unique, I think, is the ability of, um, maybe not the ability, but um, whatever emerged from bringing this ancient oxygen-consuming bacteria with this other cell that you know couldn't use oxygen, and together they've really created something that's entirely different. And the by themselves, the little oxygen-consuming bacteria and the other cell that didn't have mitochondria and couldn't evolve complexity and multicellular life by themselves, I think they were these first three things that you mentioned. The fight, the feed, and the the reproducing <laughs> ad libitum. Um, but I think when, when they came together, something very new, very different happened. And um, I, I'm not sure exactly how consciousness fit into this, but but it does uh, probably. And then now we have the ability to not just be those three things and be driven by those three things, but actually mm-hmm. use those things. So I, the image that comes to mind is you know the Maslow pyramid, where yeah. you have you know the basic need at the bottom, and only when you have these set, only when you're not hungry and and you're you know sufficiently housed and you know all of that, you can develop the higher capacities. So, you know, we have those those abilities. And uh, so I tend to put more weight on that. And uh, I do agree that this ability that we have to connect with each other and to work as communities and to, and, you know, that's that's true. At every level of biological organization, when things work together, they make bigger things possible. Uh, and I think somehow the way we evolve and all the uh, complex life forms evolve um, you know, arose from this union and this symbiosis of the, the mitochondria and the rest of the cell. I see what you mean. I'm not sure I, I see this as a driver of human behavior, <laughs> uh, but I I do think that um, yeah, there there's more there's more to us, and uh, it can be some you know, it can be become detracted when the mitochondria are not fed properly. So I, I would put basic energetic needs. And the mitochondrial needs, as you know, at the bottom of the of the pyramid. Got it. I uh, I, I like that view. And I've got uh, one more question for you, Martin. Uh, I'm I've been running an anti aging nonprofit group for twenty years, uh, based on functional medicine and what these call ortho molecular medicine before that, and um, looking at all the things that we can do to extend human life. And clearly, mitochondrial problems are at least you know, one of the big five or seven theories of aging, however you look at it. And I have a number. I think it's achievable for me to live that long, assuming you know a truck doesn't fall out of the sky on me or something like that. Um, and it's much larger than, uh, than most people's number. 
How long do you think you can live if you do things right? I'm not sure I'd have the same number for everyone. I mean you. Oh, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be different for everyone, of course. <laughs> I don't know. A hundred seems like a good number. A hundred seems like a good number. So, so you, don't, you don't aim high because, I mean, there are people who have made 120 that we know of today. 122 yeah. at least. Yeah. So. Even uh, with even with all your mitochondrial knowledge, your ability to uh, uh, you know uh, manipulate those things, whether it's with happiness or something else, and all the other stuff, you, you're still sticking to about where about where we what we can do today. Seventy years. What are you? You must be like thirty five ish or something. Thirty three. Thirty three. Okay. So then you've got another sixty five years. You don't think any progress in your field is going to happen? That's going to give you at least five years more than a hundred. <laughs> Well, I guess the, the average lifespan now is, what, 80-something 80, 80 in the U.S.? 87-ish, yeah. It's, and it's actually going down. Right. <laughs> but are you average? I mean, you're not average. Number one, you're on Bulletproof Radio, which makes you a game changer. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm just kidding. But, but seriously, you're probably far from average. Okay, you know, you're an academic, and you know, those numbers include people who have no access to health care, uh, people who um, are at many different levels of the socioeconomic spectrum, uh, people who are in prison. I, I mean, that is an average average. So it, I would guess that you're probably a little above average unless you do, you know, really dumb things like start smoking. <laughs> so, you know, 100 sounds like a good number. And maybe the reason I'm not aiming so high is because, well, first, I think it's a it's a cool number. <laughs> <laughs> it's got three make, it to, make it to 100. You know, I, I do believe in, you know, the cycle of life. And I'm not sure yeah. if I was to stick around for 200 years, you know, even if I knew some things that were useful. And, you know, <laughs> I I would tend to um, to think that, you know, everything gets recycled. You, you yeah. see leaves on a tree, you, you know, whole trees, they don't live forever, sure. even if they do good things. Uh, I hope I can do good things and then, you know, pass on good stuff to other people and then leave some resources for for younger yeah younger crops that's a beautiful answer uh so you'll you'll, you'll quit when you've uh, when you've stopped adding value uh, me too by the way i, I just <laughs> hope to be adding value for uh, my number is 180 180 okay and i'm just saying look we can do 120 today yeah. right and that's without any knowledge of mitochondrial biology or any of the other anti-aging technologies and i just somehow believe that over the next you know 100 years, 120 years. If we can't get another 50% in lifespan over 120 years, look what we did 120 years ago. We didn't have antibiotics. We didn't even understand like washing our hands before surgery 120 years ago. <laughs> For God's sake. Oops. If we can't do better than that over the next 120 years, then, uh, then you know, <laughs> damn it, I'll be dead. But anyway, th that's why that number is 50% human progress, 50%. I'm going to do the right things now based on everything that we know, at least that I know that we know. And yeah. so maybe I, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm happy to die trying. And like you said, I'll get out of the way if I stop being useful. I'm with you there. <laughs> yeah, Martin, that's... thanks for your, your work. Thanks for being on the show. I, um, I think that you're working on one of the most fundamentally important pieces of what it is to be a human, uh, in, in your lab. It, it is, is really important work you're doing. And I just want to say thanks for, for continuing to do the work and asking the really hard questions. I think you're going to uncover some, some things about the human condition that are not well known, not well understood, and will impact everyone who hears this interview. Mm. Well, thank you. It's been it's been a, a real fun, and uh, it's it's a fun journey. It's very stimulating, and I hope we learn something useful from it. Uh, the odds are high. Your research <laughs> is at picardlab.org, P-I-C-A-R-D lab.org. Uh, and I don't think it's a high volume website with caching and all. So if after the show, your website gets really slow for a day or two, that's all right. And if you guys Google Martin Picard mitochondria, you'll find all sorts of papers, including uh, some of the most seminal ones uh, in in the field, including one of my favorites, uh, which is called uh, uh, something like stress, a, a mitochondrial or a bioenergetic view of mitochondria. I'm forgetting the name of the study now. An energetic view of stress. Thank you. An energetic view of stress. I knew you'd know it. Uh, and you want to look at what stress is at a subcellular level? This guy knows. And it blows away the stuff that we've heard about stress from the other researchers of stress who are looking at it from the top down. This is bottoms up stress, what happens at the foundation of you. So this, this stuff matters, matters greatly. And I'm so happy we got to talk about it and share it with hundreds of thousands of people. Thank you. If you like today's episode, you know what to do. Go out there and upgrade your mitochondria. You know, like go for a walk. 
take a cold shower, <laughs> and the other things I talk about, get a little <laughs> sunshine, the stuff that makes you uh, stuff that makes you feel good. Because if you believe that theory that we talked about on the show today, that when you take care of your mitochondria, you might be wired to be basically a nicer, kinder human being, I think it's actually true. And one of the things that nice, kind human beings always do is leave reviews for authors like me on Amazon. So if you liked any of my books, especially Game Changers, go to Amazon and just take 10 seconds to leave hopefully a five-star review so other people can find the book. I am watching those reviews every day and I read what you type. So if my work has helped you, helped to change your life, let me know and let others know. Thank you.